Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are starting sharply at 10.30, at least from my clock. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Leonardo, Leonardo Chariglioni. I hope this is a, a good enough pronunciation. Uh, you correct me later if necessary. Uh, Leonardo uh, will present to us uh, his talk that's uh, entitled uh, from media compression to data compression to AI-enabled data coding. Uh, just a few words uh, about Leonardo. He's graduated from the Politecnico di Turino, Polito, is that right? And obtained his PhD from uh, the University of Tokyo. Uh, he has been uh, leading initiatives that help literally how media technology and businesses related to media technologies are known today. Uh, among his uh, initiatives, uh, certainly you know MPEG, uh, which he funded and uh, was chair along 32 years uh, until June uh, of this year, uh, June uh, 2020. So uh, if basically every piece of media that you play today uh, has uh, Leonardo's touch. Uh, he's currently uh, creating the MPAI, that's the Moving Picture Audio and Data Coding by Artificial Intelligence. Uh, that's a non-profit non organization that uh, will develop AI-enabled data coding standards while bringing the, the gap between standards and their practice use. Uh, Leonardo is, uh, has received many, many awards, including the IBC John Tucker Award, Edward Hine Foundation Award, uh, IEEE Masaru Ibuka Consumer Electronics Award, and the QB Foundation Award. Since 2004, he is the CEO of CDO.net, and that's a company that provides uh, advanced media technology and solutions uh, and advising to multinational uh, companies uh, on matters of, related to, to digital media. Uh, Certainly, we could spend the one and a half hour we have uh, discussing a little bit about uh, Leonardo's uh, history, resume. But uh, Leonardo, please uh, take the time you need to uh, bring uh, your presentation. We are, once again, we are very happy to have you speaking to us. Hopefully, next time we will meet uh, in person uh, here in Brazil. Thank you, Bruno. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to make the speech uh, at, at this conference. Uh, as Bruno said, it's a pity that uh, it's not a physical. I've been uh, a few times in Brazil, but never as a south as a Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, hope that this will happen in the future. So my speech will be from media compression to data compression to an AI-enabled data coding. Um, it is three components, but the middle one will be rather short for the reason that you will understand soon. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to do is to um, go back uh, about 2000 years uh, with this, um, a fable of a Phaedrus. I will uh, say both of the Latin and the Portuguese translation. We felt the malis auxilium post tempus dolet. Gelurigentem quidam colubram sustulit, sinuque fobit, contra se ipse misericors. Namque utrefecta est nequit hominem protinus. Hank alia cum rogaret causam facino vis respondit, ne quis discat prodeset improbis. So I, uh, I should also give uh, an English translation, but uh, because uh, I suppose that the most of the audience is in Portuguese, uh, I will make a, a, a translation. Unfortunately, not many uh, understand Latin these days. Achelas que ofrecem ajuda aos impius, mais tarde irão se arrepender. Um momento de bom coração, aqueceu em seu seio uma cobra que estava entorpecida de gelo. Assim que revivida, a cobra mordeu o homem. Outra cobra perguntou a razão para seu gesto e ela respondeu, 
para que ninguém aprenda a ajudar aos ímpios. Ok, that was 20,000 years ago. Of course, the world uh, is different today. But anyway, let me, let me move uh, to, to the next uh, slide. Um, of course, uh, my life has been spent not entirely, but in, in a big part uh, in, um, in standards, in particular communication standards. And my uh, assumption here is that communication and standards are essentially the same thing. You cannot have communication if you don't have standards. So the the, the very old uh, Chinese characters on the right, uh, uh, on the left, the bottom, are from China. Maybe three, four, uh, even six thousand years uh, uh, before Christ. Uh, the um, the second one is um, is from. Um, from the uh, Indus Valley civilization. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm referring to this one. This one is from, um, is from uh, Egypt. And this one is from Mesopotamia. So in all cases, you need to have an agreement on the syntax and the semantics of, uh, of the symbols. Uh, so therefore I consider the two synonymous. Then, Communication instead uh, can have different histories. Some are imposed. If you take this one, this is the uh, Korean alphabet that was uh, imposed. Uh, I mean, it was a law that uh, was created by the, the, the king of, um, of Korea many centuries ago. Um, then uh, you have uh, the Morse alphabet, and uh, this is. Uh, this was uh, independently set. I mean, Morse had uh, the idea. Uh, in other cases, it's derived that this is the ASCII characters, and it has a long history used before uh, in different forms, but uh, the principles are the same for uh, teletypes. And, uh, and lastly, agree that when uh, a group of people uh, sit together and, uh, and develop, and, uh, and then uh, they publish this. Uh, uh, this statement. So let's go back uh, 40 years ago, the beginning of uh, the uh, 1980s. So we had the many standards bodies for media. I mean, in ITU, there was a group uh, uh, working on speech and uh, a group uh, working on video. Uh, this was uh, a, a more recent situation because a speech used to be part of study group 18. Then in ITUR you had audio and video into separate groups. In ISO you had photography, cinematography, character sets in completely different groups. In ISC you had the recording of audio in one place, the recording of video in another place, audio visual equipment and receivers. So many, many standards bodies. And what happened? Well, only one uh, was created, which uh, covered compression of all media, including transport of media, serving on industry, on the other hand, independent of industries. Then uh, let's look again uh, at what happened in the past when uh, when the, the normal route was going from products to standards. So Morse um, invented the telegraph and this uh, prompted the creation of ITU. And there is a, a, a series of recommendation that is not in much in use today for telegraph transmission. Telefunken patented the, the PAL uh, system in 62 and presented in EBU, and then it was independently adopted by uh, several European countries, but not, not all. JVC released uh, the VHS video cassette recorder in 76, IEC developed the standard, Philips and Sony uh, released the compact disc, and IEC developed uh, a standard. So you see, in the past, you had products and they became standards. Please remember that because the big issues is what uh, what happens if you do the other way around. 
Then we started from a martyred reality of the silos. This was the 1980s, which was a, a, a series of silos for different industries, telco distribution, cable distribution, terrestrial broadcasting, and all had an annual broadband, baseband, uh, and, uh, and the delivery part that was obviously industry specific. Um, but this became uh, content interoperability across industries, so-called conversions. And this is the result of my vision that uh, there should be just one digital baseband. But you know, at that time, people did think to have a digital uh, copy of the analog um, status quo. Um, another um, change was from monolithic standards. So this uh, is a standard that many will probably not, not recognize anymore. It was uh, the MEC, multiplexed analog component uh, standard developed by EBU. And you know, there is one, uh, one book specifying the entire system, everything of the system. And from this monolithic standards, we went to a different situation where you have a, a series of integrated standards. Those standards are integrated, but you can select one by one and you can even change if you want. And if you want, you can reuse the standard in other places. So that was an apocal transition. And you know, that was ju not just an idea because it was implemented. And here I just give a few instances. It happened in MPEG-1, MPEG-2, MPEG-4, MPEG-7, MPEG-8 and MPEG-I. Of course, in the case of MPEG-I, the number of media types uh, increases, but you know, they are all under the same umbrella and uh, they, uh, they are supposed to be uh, combined together because they, it is an integrated standard but you can take out the single pieces. Another point, in, uh, in standard, like in, uh, in human life, you can have anarchy or you can have dictatorship and flexibility. So I found the middle ground between the two. And this is the example that I gave, I give you. MPEG-2 was a complete uh, uh, solution for audio video and systems. However, a country wanted to enshrine a specific proprietary audio solution as part of MPEG-2. I objected, and by the way, that was in um, 1994 in, pa in Paris, when I entertained the, the meeting for an hour by my ideas of standards, but then I found a solution. And the solution is that MPEG-2 systems carries a field called the format identifier, whose value indicates a non-MPEG defined format. And the field is managed by a registration authority because of course there must be a single source of numbers of values. Another point is uh, to enable interoperability without authority. So I like to say that the standard is the equivalent of the law, but you need a tribunal if you want to know if a certain action conforms to the law. And this in the standard is uh, the same story. The standard is what tells you, you should do, you shall do this way, but then you need a tribunal if, you, if two pieces, an application or a device don't interoperate. So in the telecom world, there used to be authorized testing laboratories and they were used to ensure that devices from different manufacturers could connect it to the network. On the other hand, in the consumer electronics and IT world, the notion of conformance testing had no currency. But uh, these standards were supposed to be applicable by all uh, industries. So I guided the establishment of the means to test an implementation for conformance, the tribunal thing. 
It's not exactly the tribunal, but conceptually it is. An encoder, I mean, a, a, a test, a, an encoder under test should produce a bit screen that is correctly decoded by the standard software decoder. And the decoder should be able to correctly decode conformance testing bit streams. Let's see another, um, another evolution. Probably not many of you know about H.221, but this is what was invented. I, you know, I, I was part of it in the very early phases, but then I left because I really thought it was, uh, it was misguided. So this, uh, this figure represents uh, uh, what uh, H.221 is about. So the eight bit in each octet, octet is a byte, carries the service channel. Within the service channel, bits one to eight are for frame alignment signal, and bits nine to 16 are for bit alignment signal. Audio is always carried by the first B channels, e.g. by the first two subchannels, video and data by the other subchannels, less the bitrate allocator to FAS and BAS. So this was, was uh, how the, the telco uh, used the digital technology uh, 40 years ago. But uh, of course, uh, uh, something different happened here. Uh, because uh, we introduced the packet structure. I was, since a long, long time, very much uh, moved by HDLC, uh, an acronym that probably not many of you know. Uh, but, you know, that when I saw that, I saw that is the way to go. And I tried to convince the H, the doctor, two, um, two to one people uh, to adopt it, but they didn't listen. So um, all that happened without industry control. So in total, they are 180 standards classified uh, according to numbers or, or letters. So we have many standards for media compression. Media includes other things as well. Uh, we have one standard for descriptor compression, another standard for content e-commerce, Another standard, which is about how do you combine standards in a, in a standard way. Then uh, we have system and transport, many. We have uh, two standards for multimedia platforms and uh, a few standards for device and app interfaces. So all that was done without industry control. On the other hand, it was done working within a community of partners and customers. So here you see um, the many uh, organizations, some very illustrious, um, because, you know, independence here, but collaboration on the other side. Then the other step was from audio, video, and 3D graphics, we, we said that the same technologies, well, adaptation, or maybe even new, but you know, certainly uh, the experience, the, the technique uh, to develop standard to compress audio, video, and 3D graphics could be used for other data as well. So here you see uh, what are uh, the, the reads from a high speed uh, DNA sequencing machine. So the DNA sequencing machine reads uh, snapshots of, um, of the DNA uh, that is being read, but uh, the, the snapshots don't have coordinates. So there are processes by means of which uh, uh, especially because you have a, a reference genome, you can uh, uh, organize uh, these, uh, these reads in such a way that this, what is here is the coordinate of the genome. And here you have the reads. So you see that there are a lot 
of, uh, of data that remain the same, but from time to time, you have also significant changes. From time to time, you have uh, a lot of changes just because in this particular DNA, what was uh, uh, symbol uh, G in the reference genome, here is symbol A. So how do you compress that? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but uh, uh, what, is, what you do is you take uh, uh, slices of, um, of the DNA, uh, you classify uh, the, the reads, uh, because reads can have, uh, say, reads that are perfectly equal to the reference genome. That is one class, read that they have changes, and so on and so on. Then for each of these, you compute uh, descriptors and, uh, and you compress the descriptors using uh, uh, CABHC, which is something that is used uh, in several uh, video compression standards. Not just that, uh, neural network compression uh, is uh, something that I launched in uh, October, um, 2018, so it's just two years ago. And this has gone a long, a long way. The, the motivation was uh, there are, and there will be more and more uh, neural networks in your device, especially mobile devices. And you know, you need to update uh, the, the neural network because you know, now you, you have a, a neural network that does better things uh, the, in the, for same, performs better for the same things or does more things. And therefore, because a neural network can have sizes of many gigabytes, compression is, uh, is a vital technology. So there was also several cases, we have also several cases of developing comprehensive mo um, models. So this was for the interaction um, between uh, real and uh, virtual world and between virtual and virtual worlds. So this is a set of uh, uh, very uh, foundational uh, standard. And this is uh, the, uh, the, the full picture of uh, all the standards produced. So those who, who are in, uh, in yellow uh, are uh, not active anymore. No, no work is being done. Um, then uh, they are, um, the rest is uh, a standard on which they, we are still doing something. For instance, MPEG-2 systems is, uh, is a very vital standard that uh, is, continues to, to have uh, more and more additions. Then another, another point. So this is the, um, I say very old, I don't want to use uh, other adjectives, uh, very traditional organization of ISO, where you have uh, the technical management board and you have technical committees reporting to the management board. And then you have uh, subcommittees reporting to technical committees. And then you have working groups uh, uh, reporting to subcommittees. That, uh, okay, maybe, maybe when you, when you are at that level, you need such a hierarchical organization. But uh, where I could, I implement a completely different flat and fluid organization. How is this work? So we have an area which is called uh, uh, compression extracts in, in transport of, um, um, of uh, audio, video, and systems. Um, and uh, so therefore you, you have uh, all these uh, groupings here, but uh, you have a technical coordination inside, which is made by the chairs of these groups uh, who create larger groups by putting together um, organizational units in order to achieve a specific task. And then uh, when the work is done, uh, 
uh, organization disappears, but the unit remains because these are the key elements of a competence within the organization. So as you see, this, uh, this has been uh, very effective and uh, probably I should say was very effective. Not just that, this organization uh, was not anarchy and, and was not um, dictatorship, but, uh, but it, was, it was very productive. So if you see the, uh, the green, you will see that this working group uh, used to produce more standard than any other uh, committee at higher level. So you can say that producing the number of standards produced is not, uh, is not a real measure. And I couldn't agree with you more than that. That is why I have extracted what I, I think are the, the standard best in town. So MPEG-1, we have MP3 and we have uh, the video CD for which used MPEG-1 video. Then MPEG-2, I, don't sh I should not use uh, any word. MPEG-4 is a collection, an enormous collection, I would say, of, uh, of standards. MPEG-A, uh, I mean, we, we have uh, several um, standards from MPEG-A that have been uh, uh, quite successful. MPEG-H dash needs no introduction. MPEG-H uh, did no introduction. In MPEG B, we have uh, some, uh, some elements. In MPEG 7, we have one, just one element, which I like to mention uh, for a video production exchange, which is called the ABDP. So uh, many standards, but also uh, some of them with the, are greatly used. And uh, well, let's go. Let's go to really to the bottom line. And here we are talking about, about dollars. So what is the impact uh, on the market of devices and services? So the numbers that you will see here is not uh, the value of the technology, it's the value of the device, the market of the device, okay? But each of these devices without the standard could not exist. So in this sense, uh, this uh, talks about impact on the market because it's really an enabling factor. So you see that half a trillion dollars is for just the smartphones, TV cents in 100 billion and so on and so on. So it is, uh, if you make uh, a, an addition of all the numbers on the left, you will get uh, uh, one trillion dollars. And if you make the same, uh, on the right, uh, you will see $500 billion. So this is the some impact on the market. Now, you remember that um, I said uh, at the beginning, going from product to standards. That was kind of easy way because company has a good idea, it is successful on the market and then it goes uh, to a standards body for ratification. That is not really interesting, but certainly it was successful and used to work. What about going from standards to products? Okay, so here you have MPEG-1. For video, there is no known license. For audio, there, there was what I would call an enlightened license. For MPEG-2, Patent pool was established and it was very successful. For um, MPEG-4 visual and AVC, the same patent pool, very successful. For audio, uh, a, a different patent pool, but again, uh, very successful. MPEG-7, there was an attempt at creating a patent pool, but it was thwarted by one patent holder. For MPEG H, HCVC, which uh, was uh, published seven years ago, it's close to eight years ago now, uh, there are three patent pools uh, 
and uh, more than 10 uh, standard essential patent holders that are not in the patent pool. And for 3D audio, there is no published license. For MPEG I, we have VVC, which has been uh, published. There is no news about license. I doubt that this means that it is good news. Okay, so let me um, go to the end of the first part of this uh, uh, speech of mine. Uh, the title is, if we don't act, we risk becoming fossils. That is true for everything in, in this world. Few consideration, digital media is a mature market. It's 30 years old, or at least 25 years old if you want to start from MPEG-2. Standards for digital media face a market with many providers of standards. In the past, a scarcity of bandwidth was the enabling factor, but now it's no longer the main factor. Not, not always, I mean. And then the attitude is some look for the best, but some may just look for the good. Therefore, and that is something that I started probably more than 10 years ago, um, started to create a royalty-free standard for video compression. Three attempts, web video coding failed because the AVC baseline uh, had the FRAND declaration. Internet video coding failed. I mean, technically, it was very good because it proved that that was about five years ago, we could get uh, a better than AVC quality, but there are three random declaration and therefore this uh, cannot be described as a royalty free standard and video coding for browser, it failed because there is one no license declaration. Then there was um, a ruling that uh, no license declaration must declare the technology and this is a great thing, but it's for the wrong problem because it should not be applied only to uh, no license declaration. It should be applied to all license declaration, but this is not happening and it's not going to happen. Therefore, this is my conclusion uh, for this first part that some do risk. And uh, the picture illustrates the, the potential risk. Let's go then to the second uh, um, item in the title from data compression in the hiding. Why in the hiding? Because data compression was not in the scope. Still, a lot of data compression was done. And here you have a table and for sure I don't want uh, to spend the time, but let me just take one. Face and body animation. Um, this, I mean, this was work done 25 years ago when, uh, when you still faced uh, uh, telephone modems to access the internet. Um, so, but we, we succeeded in making uh, compression of face animation and body animation. <coughs> Then there was an attempt to make data compression the real topic. And uh, in July 2018, UNI, the Italian, mem member, Italian member body of ISO, proposed to create a new technical committee on data compression technologies. <coughs> the proposal was rejected. Okay, so let me have, uh, before going to, to the next uh, and last topic, um, have a little story that goes back to 1000 years ago. In the Holy Roman Empire, there was Kingdom J and Margrave M. Margrave M had successfully expanded into the Eastern territories, but, 
King Jay, who had never done anything useful, wanted to take control of Marguerite M, but had to get rid of Margrave. So Margrave resisted. He claimed his achievement. I have expanded the territories. I comply with the feudal duties of allegiance. So King Jay sent emissaries in hiding to bribe some ambitious vessels and sweet the talk at the vessels. Then he threatened the retaliation to those not bending. Finally, King Jay crushed the remaining supporters by military force. <coughs> I'm sorry. So the next is about building the new on the ruins of the past. Some strategy consideration. Let's take artificial intelligence. It's more and more used and it improves the coding efficiencies of existing data types and can be used to code new data types as well. So let's uh, dwell in a, a, a moment on the meaning of coding, data coding in particular. My definition of data coding is the transformation of data that is in one representation to another equivalent representation that is more suitable for a specific application. So one, uh, of course, one very interesting application is compression, less bits, but it's not necessarily that because uh, you wanted to preserve the semantics of the data as much as possible, and that is the case of compression. But there are other cases where you are not so much interested in that, the more in bringing out the aspects of the semantic that are most important to an application and which are hidden in the data. So here comes the experience of standards because they ensure interoperability of in and integration of application. Therefore, we need a, a standard organization on data coding that is focused on AI as its core technology. There's another reason for doing that. Um, and that proves that AI is not just a fancy of the moment, a catchword that uh, everybody uses and maybe six, six months later, no one remembers. AI enabled data coding is justified by the fact that AI allows you to tap from the results of a lot of research that is being done by a lot of people globally. So here are a, a few examples, representation learning, transfer learning, edge AI, uh, model integration, reproduci reproducibility of performance. So all these and more are all areas on which a lot of uh, investigations are being done. And, uh, and in the future, we can tap uh, uh, from the result of these investigations. So this is the reason behind the creation of uh, this organization, um, MPAI, Moving Picture Audio and Data Coding by Artificial Intelligence, a not-for-profit organization uh, of global scope, but incorporated in Switzerland with the mission to promote the efficient use of data. And we have two prongs. First, develop technical specification. And the specification are about the coding of any type of data, especially using artificial intelligence, but also other technology that facilitated the use of, um, of this uh, or the other standards. And the second important prong is bridging the gap between technical specification and their practical use. So here we are back to uh, going from standard to products. And uh, the fact that the old model is uh, not working anymore. Therefore, uh, the idea is to 
develop intellectual intellectual property guidelines, intellectual property rights guidelines, in the particular framework license, I will say a few words at the end. But before that, uh, um, let me say who can be an MPIM member, any legal entity. So uh, members have to be uh, legal entities, not persons, but we have an exception, um, which is dictated by practical considerations in many universities. You can be an individual who represents a technical department. That, uh, uh, that is also allowed to be a member. That is the exception to the first point. What is the organization? There is a general assembly that does all the technical work. And then there's a board of director that handles several other things. And then there is a secretary. MPAI is an inclusive community. And uh, we have three levels of inclusion. Even if you are a non-member, you may submit the proposal of use cases. You can contribute to the aggregation of use cases into areas. And you can participate in the early phases of requirement development. So it is, it is inclusive, it is open, it cannot be totally open because then you have associate members and they can fully participate in and contribute technologies to the development of MPAI standards. And then you have the principal members who uh, may elect and participate in MPAI governance and vote on policy matters. So let's see, uh, to give more concreteness about uh, the, the work of, uh, of this community. So, we discuss a proposal of use cases from non-members in open meetings and from members in open meetings unless the proposing member um, does not agree. Further discussion can happen outside. Uh, then the discussion and access to documents is also open during the use case stage. And discussion on technical proposal in open meetings may continue during the requirement stage, unless the general uh, assembly says, no, this is a critical matter, um, this uh, must stop. And participation in further stages uh, by non-members is, uh, is not allowed. So uh, use case is really the foundation stone of, um, of, uh, of MPAI. So how do we describe a use case? First of all, we have the proponent, but the description that says what it is, a any comments. Example of how practically this works, a preliminary set of requirements, the definition of object of standard. When you talk about AI, it's not immediate to uh, agree on what the need to be standardized. You see that a standard may be, may be helpful, but uh, you don't want to have a standard that uh, uh, stops uh, innovation. You want to have a standard that promotes innovation. Then which are the benefits of such a standard? Which are the bottlenecks? Uh, uh, what the impact uh, or the social impacts? Uh, how are we going to measure the success of this standard? So many st standards are produced that uh, are never used uh, and we want to avoid uh, that. And then uh, how is this uh, use case document organized? We are now at uh, um, revision 1.3. Um, it's organized by media, still pictures, moving feet, picture, audio, event sequences, and other data. So it's organized by data type, not by, by media. And uh, for each of them, we see what are the possible application in media entertainment, transportation, telco, information technology, aerospace, manufacturing, healthcare, food and beverage, science and technologies, and other domains. So it's a very thick document, probably 200 pages nowadays. Uh, and, and all everything that I'm going to talk in a minute uh, comes from this document. Um, because we propose, uh, people propose many use cases and then we aggregate them until we, we see them that the aggregation really deserves a standard. 
So what is the standard development process? We have uh, the, the stage of the uh, use cases, then functional requirements, and then commercial requirements. Commercial requirement is what uh, in, uh, in many standard bodies is not considered unless you say then the FRN uh, declaration is a commercial requirement. Um, then call for technologies, standard development, and uh, the achievement of, uh, of the final stage of uh, standard. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about a few of the um, development that we are having. So uh, these uh, standards, I mean, I'm anticipating what I, I expect will be a, de a decision of the General Assembly tomorrow. So don't take this as an absolute uh, word, but I do expect that uh, um, these will be confirmed uh, uh, from a use case uh, to functional requirements. It means that from now on, we are going to develop the requirements of, this, uh, of these uh, um, standards. So the first one is the artificial intelligence framework. So the purpose is to enable creation and automation of a mixed uh, processing and inference workflows. But the, the, the processor, the processing uh, modules can be machine learning based, uh, AI based, or traditional data processing based. So the, the key components of the framework concern the different modalities of operation, what I've just said, data pipeline jungles and computing resource allocations, and constrained hardware scenarios of edge AI devices. I've already used this word before. And the framework is in, com comprises the processing modules, the orchestrator, and uh, the component that is data storage. And this is explained here. <clears throat> so here we have a number of uh, of processing modules that have an input and may have an output. These are uh, organized by an, by an orchestrator that can create, can create pipelines of processing elements. I will soon give you uh, <coughs> examples of, of this. And they can also use access uh, data, uh, which can be temporary data or can be uh, long-term storage data. So here, there's a number of requirements. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to describe uh, them all, but what is important is that uh, there should be a common interface for processing modules and common data representation for storage. So essentially, it's all about uh, uh, interfaces, uh, but then, uh, for instance, another important uh, requirement is to allow uninterrupting functionality while algorithms or machine learning uh, models are updated or retained. So they are a number of requirements, but these are very initial. These are not uh, sufficiently detailed to be able to um, issue a, a call for technology. Let's go to this, uh, this one, which is, uh, context-based audio enhancement. So what is this use case about? Uh, it is about, uh, so you are uh, um, making a phone call in a noisy place, and you would like to have some help removing the unwanted noise. Or you are at home, maybe you live on the ground floor and the streetcar uh, passes and there's a lot of noise and you would like not to be disturbed in your um, in your audio experience. So this are what we uh, we are thinking. Uh, this uh, context-based audio enhancement uh, will be use useful for. And the benefit of this will be that uh, technology providers don't have to develop a full solution. They can develop the single component, so they can concentrate on where they have particular expertise in, instead of uh, dispersing uh, their effort in other areas that for which they are not necessarily competent. 
then equipment manufacturers and application vendors can uh, get uh, these uh, solutions from an open market, uh, guaranteed because uh, they are standard interfaces. Service providers can de deliver um, superior user experience exactly for the same uh, reasons. And then users can have a competitive market, which at the moment it is not. So it's really competition enabled by horizontal markets. So this is how this, uh, this orchestration thing uh, can work. So here we, we are considering the case of audio conference. Um, so many of you, I think, have uh, daily audio conferences and, may, and many times uh, they happen from, uh, from the, the private home of uh, the participants and, and very often you have uh, unwanted uh, noise, well, then uh, this is what, uh, what you can do. So here you have the input signal, here you have a voice recognition mod, uh, module, a noise cancellation component, an output dynamic noise cancellation, and finally you have the optimized audio experience uh, at the output. This other one is audio on the go. So here you are listening to, uh, to a, um, to music, for instance, while you are riding a bike in the, in the city. So you want not uh, the, the external noise not to disturb your experience. On the other hand, important noise, uh, like a, a honking car after you, that should preserve. And here again, you have uh, the possibility to create a pipeline of uh, processing modules. Let's uh, go to this other uh, use case which is uh, in integrative analysis of genomic sensor experiments. So what is, what is the issue here? That uh, when you deal with genomic things, uh, every experiment generates terabytes of data. And this is, it is increasing uh, very, very fast. Um, then you have a, a next train, which is another uh, source of, uh, um, of, of data and can be used for cancer, personalized medicine, COVID-19 and so on and so on. And uh, the point is that genomic data alone is not enough because uh, you have, uh, in many cases, you have uh, the genomic component and other components as well. And this is what I would like uh, uh, to, to show uh, here. <coughs> so you, you have uh, uh, human cancer genomic and personalized medicine. You have uh, integrative omics where you uh, connect different ways of exploring how the cell works. This is, this is the subject of very intense research nowadays. Um, or you can have a single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, and here, uh, this, this is important because here you have to connect the composition of RNA with, with other information like lineage, pheno, um, phenotype uh, on the cells that produces it. Uh, other uh, are here, uh, spatial uh, metabolomics. This is about uh, uh, studying um, uh, proteins created by a cell. And uh, th there is technology where you, you can cut um, the, the protein into, uh, into cu little cubes, uh, little volumes. And, uh, and then you want to know, uh, not just uh, the, the protein content, but also the spatial position of what is called here voxel. And uh, animal behavior. So for instance, uh, you, you, you are uh, considering uh, pigs, uh, other, other animals um, with a certain DNA, and you want to study the effect of the DNA with the, with the behavior of, uh, of the animals or in the lab or, or in the environment. And finally, you have a smart farming. Here again, uh, you are acting on the DNA and you want to see the result. And you know, you, you can have a small plots, you can have 100 of them. And uh, you want to have automatically a survey of how uh, the different uh, plots uh, uh, move. Uh, 
Uh, and all this connection is always done with algorithms that are based on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this is another example of how uh, the framework is implemented. Here you have the orchestrator, here you have some processing elements, here you have the data storage, and here you have the specific uh, data type that, uh, you're at, that the application or the processing component can access via standard API. AI enhanced video coding is uh, another um, area that we are uh, addressing. So from the literature, we see that you can probably get uh, up to 30%, but you know, this is needs to be confirmed in, uh, in, a, in a more precise way. Therefore, we are investigating the possibility to improve compression by 25 to uh, 50% of an existing standard with acceptable complexity. And we do that using published results uh, in an homogeneous fashion. If this investigation will be su successful, we will develop a standard. We are aware of research on hybrid schemes. And there will be a, a figure later on. And therefore we are conducting two parallel activity. One, the development of this uh, assessment of the state of the art and uh, the other one, uh, the development of requirements. So all this is about starting from an existing standard and uh, uh, add or replace or enhance existing tools uh, with, uh, um, with AI inside. Therefore, the choice of the starting point is important. Because if we start from very high performance coding, codecs, um, we will face uh, the case uh, that I have described in HCBC. And uh, it's probably impossible to convince the all patent holders to allow MPAI to extend the codec with uh, um, compliant uh, AI based tools. Therefore, we are planning to pick. Uh, essential video coding, because uh, the baseline is not encumbered by IPR, at least this is the report. Um, the main profile has a limited number of uh, standard essential patent holders. And uh, there is an EVC patent holder who has said that will make available a full implementation of EVC as open source software. So therefore, uh, this is how we are going to operate. So this is uh, a more concrete description <clears throat> of our plan of work. So we will start from um, EBC and we will act uh, on all these uh, uh, elements and, and see the effect of uh, uh, replacing uh, the existing tool with this other AI based tool. But you know, this is done using published information. This is not a competitive uh, exercise. It's just uh, to make an assessment of uh, how good uh, the performance is. And then in parallel, we have the hybrid, um, which is uh, uh, you have a, a, any, um, any existing codec and uh, you are adding a, a layer on top of it and then you want to improve the performance, the overall performance, which is, which is very important and very useful because then you can uh, uh, easily um, have a, 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 a backward compatible solution. Therefore, what we are doing is uh, uh, the development of requirements and the collaborative evidence uh, conditions. Let's go to another case. So from here, you see that we are taking uh, literally uh, the word the data. So one is about, uh, is about uh, um, video, one is about audio, but one is about the genome. And this other one is about uh, um, something different, which is, by the way, very related uh, to, to video. So if you take uh, um, uh, online gaming, you have uh, two approaches. Um, you have traditional online gaming. And in this case, uh, you have a server that receives data from the clients and sends uh, 
uh, other data to the client so that the client can create the appropriate video frame. So the server is there, is controlling the clients based on what the user does, but the video is created by the client. In cloud gaming, the server receives a sequence of data from the client again, but the sensor an input dependent sequence of video frames to the client. In case the connection has temporary high latency or packet loss, there can be two strategies. One is to have client side prediction and the other one is to have server side prediction. And uh, so this is pictured here. Here you have uh, the clients and here you have the server and uh, these are data data uh, from the client to the server and data from the server to the client. But in the case of cloud gaming, we have actually uh, the client uh, which uh, run uh, in the cloud on virtual machines. And you have uh, therefore um, data from the client, but you have video uh, from, uh, from, from uh, from the server, uh, conceptually from the server. Um, so uh, during an online uh, racing game, it may happen that uh, at the time, you see that the vehicle is going straight to the wall when it reaches a curve. But at a few seconds later, the player sees that the vehicle has been teleported to the rear position because uh, uh, the, um, the client was forced to uh, use uh, uh, the internal information. And so it, uh, it sent the, uh, the, the vehicle to, to the wall while instead it was, uh, it was making a turn. So AI can mitigate this issue. So here, let me see what uh, um, an example of what I'm saying. I hope that uh, you will be able to see what I'm seeing here. So uh, here you have uh, uh, two players and you have uh, the blue one who is trying to overtake uh, the, the, and so here you see that uh, the, 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 motor, the, the motorbike is, is coming much later and therefore this is completely false uh, user experience. Uh, sorry. Okay, therefore here is what I, uh, uh, what MPAI, uh, plans to do is to introduce uh, um, artificial intelligence in the server uh, and um, therefore what are the object of the standard? Um, we have, um, we want to define a standard representation of the main parameters, parameters of uh, the game state, a standard set of high resolution time stamped game messages uh, a standard set of high resolution timestamp uh, data types, uh, input and output, and a standard interface with a video encoder, in particular with MPAI EVC. So it's the possibility to attach uh, the new uh, code that will probably de develop uh, to, to this, uh, and then uh, interfaces to market adopted the delivery schemes. Let me go to the last uh, that we are. Uh, developing. Um, so we have a multimodal conversation. Uh, the purpose is to enable human machine conversation that emulates human to human conversation in completeness and intensity by using AI. So who's going to use it? It's a, a conversation between a user and a computer or a robot. So in chat, I am bored, what should I do? And then uh, the answer can be, you look tired, why don't you take a walk and so on and so on. Uh, so this improves the user experience and uh, this is uh, achieved by defining standard interfaces of reusable component, the uh, processing modules that I was talking about. And uh, the benefit is to make uh, the market horizontal and competitive. So, and this is the, the example in the case uh, of, um, so you wanted to um, make a, a speech interface, but if you want uh, the focus here is on recognizing uh, the emotion. 
And so here you see that uh, we have a speech recognition, image analysis, language and the same language analysis, because of course you need to detect the, 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 mo the emotion. Uh, emotion recognition, uh, dialogue processing and speech synthesis. So then you have an architecture of uh, the one that I have, I have explained uh, in the AI framework that is capable of uh, creating pipelines of processing modules that achieve a certain goal. Um, so the object of the standard, the interfaces, the processing component interfaces, the delivery protocol interfaces, the framework itself is done by MPAI AIF. So these are the current areas. We have a uh, um, six area. I don't talk of the seventh area, which is in, uh, still at, uh, at an initial stage, but it's very interesting as well, because uh, this is about uh, the data uh, the, the zillions of data that a company produces with a lot of information inside, and you can use uh, um, AI compression in order to understand what uh, this, uh, this data, uh, what information this data carry. Let me go to the last point, which is the notion of framework license. I said before that developing standard is good, but if the standard cannot be used, then there is no much fun. And uh, maybe people will understand that there is no, really no fun in developing standard that cannot be used. So the framework license is not a license, it's a business model. It's the business model to remunerate the uh, IP in the standard. The business model therefore does not have values, that does not have dollars, does not have percentage, does not have dates. And that the process is the following. Before the start of the technical work, all active members, which means those who participate in the technical development, develop and, uh, and adopt the framework license by a qualified majority. All technical contributors declare that they will make available the terms of the license related to their essential patents according to the framework license, alone or jointly in a patent pool after the General Assembly approved the standard and in no event after the commercial implementation of the technical standard, technical specification. All members declare they will take a license for the essential patents held by other members if used within one year of the publication by IPR holders of their license in turn. So this is a set of minimal constraints that MPAI members accept um, in terms of uh, how they will license their IP um, in a standard. Of course, uh, all IPR holders have to be um, MPI members or their technology will not be used. So these are simple examples. I have two examples for the HCVC uh, license. So this is what MPEG-LA did. This is taken from what they published on their uh, website. What you see in, uh, in yellow is uh, something that uh, shall be expressed in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this sense. So the royalties will be the, of R dollars per unit. And uh, the royalty applies from a date. If the licensee sells more than N units per year or the royalties based are below a cap of C dollars. So the framework license should simply have the text without the numbers. And this is even more clear for the advanced license, the HEVC advanced license, because here you see, um, you don't say for the duration for how many years, what is the, the, the beginning, what will be the renewal, um, what will be uh, the rates, for instance, in the case of HEVC, um, they are uh, two tiers. Uh, the uh, tier one countries that pay more and tier, one, tier two countries that pay less, less. So in that case, it will be Y percent in the sense that the license will have that number, but the framework license does not have. Okay, so this is uh, my conclusion. 60 billion years ago, 
uh, 60 million years ago, sorry, uh, or 65, um, a, a meteorite uh, struck the, the earth and uh, the um, dinosaurs uh, disappeared. Maybe that will be the case. So uh, I am happy to have uh, had uh, your attention and uh, let me uh, close here my speech, uh, thanking you for your attention. Thank you, Leonardo, for the very interesting talk. Uh, I hope you can see me now. Uh, uh, so we have a few questions. Uh, before that, uh, I'd like to just call attention to all attendees that uh, we have this uh, best poster award please go to our website and, and vote for the best poster. Uh, and now we can move to a few questions. Leonardo, we have, uh, I'll start with the chat questions here. Uh, we have uh, a question from Professor Gauthier Lafrout uh, from Brussels. Uh, he, he made this question in two different moments. So there are two questions here. The first one, so MPAI is not about compression, but rather about interfaces. For instance, uh, cloud computing. It's a, a modular architecture approach, right? And uh, eight minutes later, because of the, the moments of your talk, he asked, MPAI is, however, a compression module. Uh, so uh, can you uh, discuss a little bit on that? Uh, sure, sure. I mean, this is no different from my previous life in the sense that in my previous life we defined rather complex interfaces um, and, and that was uh, that was it then of course then there were um, the transport which is somehow different but in any case we are always talking of interfaces um, so we are not going to say uh, use this neural network but we may say that you can take a, a neural network to do a certain job then you define an interface so that you can define another net, another neural network that does the subsequent job. If I can go back to, to here, uh, exactly this. So language understanding, speech recognition, emotion recognition, dialect processing, all these will be one or more uh, neural networks doing that they, and they will be interface one to another, and we define the interfaces. Sorry, my microphone was muted. Uh, thank you, Leonardo. Uh, Professor Agostini, that's my colleague of mine uh, here in Federal University of Pelotas. Uh, he asks, uh, he thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, and the questions, I have one question to MPAI. How could our group collaborate with MPAI? I think at, at some level you have already addressed this question, but I think it's important to reinforce it. Which research opportunities you think that we could explore together? Okay. Um, my, uh, in my previous life, liaison with this external organization has been my uh, uh, obsession. It has not. I did not have the time to make to make a, um, a liaison. My next objection. My next obsession. But I can tell you that uh, the MPAI board has already discussed, and we have agreed that uh, uh, we will need uh, we will need uh, a, a group that deals uh, with uh, uh, industry and the standard. Uh, and research liaison. Um, then uh, my, uh, my reaction to how can we collaborate? Well, my, uh, my reaction is very easy. Joining MPAI as an associate member, which means that you have a full right to participate in technical discussion, develop standards, make proposal, and so on will cost 480 euros until the end of 2021. So I think that the best way to collaborate with MPAI is to join MPAI. 
On the other hand, we will find ways to, to have a collaboration. And, and I would repeat, um, probably 40% of our members are from academia and from research centers. So we welcome um, research and academia for the reason that I've said, there's so much research that is going on in AI that um, if we want to have standards that are state of the art, we must work closely with research and, uh, and academia. Sounds good. And it, it was interesting to see that uh, all those initial steps uh, are, are completely open to anyone that wants to discuss, even for non-members. This, this is really interesting. On the other hand, if I may, Bruno, uh, the real fun starts when the actual technology is on the table. And that part is for members only. Sure. So sure, making is. proposal, making proposal of use cases. If you have any proposal, please um, uh, send me an email or send an email to the secretariat. Uh, if you want to join the discussion on requirements that will drive the drafting of the call for technologies, please do so. But as I said, the fund will be excluded from you. Okay, uh, I think it's clear. Uh, we have a question from Professor uh, Suzin from Porto Alegre. Uh, he thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, when some media compression is uh, generated using AI support, can we be sure on the completeness of the source signal recovering at the decoding process? Well, I would say that this question is an integral part of, uh, of what compression is. So when, when compression was done the old way, essentially using the statistics of the data, you never had guarantee that you had uh, exact uh, reproduction at, uh, at the decoding side. Here with artificial intelligence, the challenge is even more because as I said, um, very often we use compression to bring out the semantic that is inside. If I can take the example of, um, of what is called compression and understanding of industrial data. So you, you have a, a, a flow of data that come out from a, a company. They can be the number of pieces produced, the number of fade pieces, uh, the invoices uh, in, the, invoice, uh, the invoices out, um, the revenues, uh, the salaries. I mean, you have a huge amount of data, but eventually if you are the owner or you have the board of this company, you want to know where your company is going. So in that case, you are interested in, in getting from the data, the scenario that are interested for you, which is how I'm going to pay the bills six months from now, two years from now, um, is there a risk of bankruptcy in uh, three years from now and so on and so on. In order to have those data, which are the data that the decoder uh, needs, uh, you, will not, you are not going to transmit the fact that employee number 35 has got 2000 euros as salary this month. So it is intrinsic in the design of the compression driven by the application at the level of distortion, if I may use the word that, that you can tolerate. Okay, thank you, Leonardo. Uh, now we have a question from Professor Guilherme Correa, also here from Pelotas. He thanks for, for the interesting talk. Uh, and the question is, can you talk a bit more about the idea of complexity scalability support in the MPAI framework you mentioned? Is that also expected in the MPAI uh, EVC uh, currently under, under development? Um, okay, I, I would love to answer this question, say six months from now, but uh, 
I would like to warn uh, the, the, kind, uh, the kind listeners and this professor for this question. Um, MPAI was established exactly three weeks ago. We have been working uh, for three months and, uh, and, and that is as much as I can say. So we have a lot of work that has been put in by, by the people. But if you ask me what, it, what is going to be of NPAI EVC, I'm sorry, this is really too early to say. On the other hand, if, uh, if your colleague Bruno wants to, wants to know, he should just join NPAI. And by the way, if he, if he is your colleague from your university by joining, all professors, all students of, uh, of your university even if they are associate, which means for 480 uh, euros per, per year, um, is uh, they will be uh, able to join, uh, contribute, discuss, propose, uh, um, and develop standards. So it's an opportunity that is open to all. Yeah, that's indeed a great opportunity. Uh, Leonardo uh, Giordano is, is making a question here. He, he, he brings a set of compliments and also, uh, uh, his question is about AI video coding, uh, uh, and and the question is also: Will AI video coding run well in current technologies? I, I think it's a, uh, as an extension, right? How far are we from running such a system in real time? Well, this question brings me back uh, thirty years ago with MPEG one when people question, how can you run in real time uh, this standard? And I can say that my, my, my group uh, in Telecom Italia, uh, uh, 30, about 13, well, less than that, maybe 20, uh, 27 or 28 years ago, gave an answer to that. And it was a full rack uh, of, uh, of electronics that, um, that could do it. And today, you know, uh, an MPEG-1 decoder could probably take 0.1% uh, of the CPU of, uh, of any smartphone. Mm. So it's clear that we are at a technological transition. And uh, it is important that uh, we design uh, this, uh, this codec uh, with, uh, with this uh, strict uh, uh, contact and interaction and participation uh, from the people who manage the implementation technology. And we have, we have some of them uh, in, uh, in our members. Um, so I am unable to say, can we implement it? The essay is uh, join and, uh, and let's make an assessment together. Sounds good. Uh, we have a question from uh, Pedro Freitas. Uh, he asks, who are the contributors of MPAI SPG? I think it's for, for gaming, right? For SPG standard. Does it have a contribution from gaming industry like big players like Microsoft, Rockstar, EA, etc.? We have uh, companies that uh, work closely with the companies mentioned. We don't have the big companies uh, mentioned yet. But as I said, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the third week that we have been established. We have already uh, quite a detailed um, description of what uh, this uh, SPG, uh, MPAI SPG standard will look like. And uh, the intention is that after this will be approved uh, by the General Assembly uh, tomorrow, uh, we will um, in earnest get in touch with all these companies because of course they must be part of the game if you want to be successful. Sure. Leonardo, I'll make you one more question. Then I'll keep one question to myself if you allow me uh, before closing. Uh, the, this this uh, question is from uh, Professor Daniel Palomino also from, from Pelotas. Uh, thanks for the great talk. What's your opinion on initiatives outside the traditional standardization organizations like AV1 Video Codec? Uh, somewhere, it, it will probably take uh, uh, too long to, 
uh, to find the slide, I, I said that um, we are actually, I, I know where to go. So let me show it again. Okay. Uh -huh. I said that digital media is a mature market and that standards for digital media face a market with many providers. So AV1 is a player. There are other players, but I am, so if, if, I, if I can put the things uh, in a simplified way, the MPEG standards were based on, uh, on, on RAND, on FRAND, and the FRAND uh, model has hit the wall. AV1 comes up. I mean, it's a good, uh, it's a good, good technology. On the other hand, there are some who say that uh, this is not technology that is entirely in the hands of AV1 members. I certainly don't want to enter into that debate, but uh, so they offer something that is royalty free. And on the other hand, uh, there is an offer of something that is not royalty free. In the past, you, you would know how much you own to whom, Today, you don't. MPAI wants to be in the middle. Our standards are not meant to be royalty free. I mean, it doesn't mean that we will not make royalty free standard. Uh, that is entirely the decision of uh, the people who do the work. But we are not meant to be uh, only royalty free. We want to make a standards where the market knows before the work starts, so before the standard is delivered, what will be the conditions, not the money that will be out, but the condition at which they can access the technology. So I think it's a, it's a position in the middle and uh, I am confident that this is what industry needs. Thank you. This, this is really an interesting discussion. Uh, Leonardo, if you allow me, I'll bring one question from my side and then I'll give you also the floor to, to give your final comments and, and uh, here I also once again thank you for, for taking your time to speak to, to us at DPVSA. Uh, hopefully in the future we'll have you once again but in person in Brazil. Okay, so uh, my question to conclude is it's really not technical but the question is where do you see uh, MPAI in the coming five and, and 10 years from now? If you had asked me what I, I, uh, I would see uh, MPEG 30 years ago in 10 years, I would have given you the wrong answer. And so probably I, I would give uh, uh, the same wrong answer if I give today. Uh, I want to describe what is the path that we are creating. We are creating a, we have created because we do exist. Um, we have created a, a body, a not-for-profit uh, with clear ideas about artificial intelligence is the main, not exclusive, but the main technologies uh, on which we will focus to develop standard in the interest of the industry and standard for what? For data coding, where data coding means transformation of data in from one format to another format, according to the needs of the user. So I, I think that this responsiveness to uh, industry needs for the real form of digital transformation. Everybody in the industry talks about digital transformation. 
MPEG did start a digital transformation 30 years ago. MPAI starts digital transformation based on AI today. That is the promise that we make. Thank you, Leonardo. If you want to give a, a few final words. Well, the, the, the words are very, very simple. I would like to thank you, Bruno, for inviting me to, um, to, to make this speech. It's a, it, it, as always, it's a, it, it was a big, uh, a big engagement, particularly because tomorrow I have the, uh, the General Assembly of MPAI, which is also another big, big, big challenge. But you know, I did it with pleasure, and it is, as always, an opportunity to think about one, uh, myself. Uh, this was a great opportunity. I hope that um, you have appreciated my, the first part of my talk, where I said, from something to something else. That, I think, has been my contribution to humankind, to have changed uh, many things for the better. Um, I was not allowed to change uh, other things for the better, but uh, I have a, an opportunity in front of me and I hope I will be able to accomplish uh, my uh, self-imposed mission. And uh, because of that, um, please join MPAI. It's, uh, it's very easy to join, it's inexpensive. I mean, it, it can even uh, be uh, at no cost, even though at uh, only at a certain uh, certain level, but uh, it it is something that is open. So please uh, take profit of that. Thank you to all. So uh, finally, we we thank again Leonardo. Uh, the pleasure was ours to have you here. To everyone else, uh, thank you for for uh, taking your time and listening to this. Uh, uh, to Leonardo, uh, certainly uh, was really instructive. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, I use this time also to once again uh, call your attention for our program. Uh, during the afternoon, we are having Professor Fernando Pereira from, uh, from Lisbon. Uh, then we have a poster session. And after that, we have Leisang from Microsoft. Uh, all during this afternoon, uh, note that you are receiving another uh, link for connecting. We are having a different session during the afternoon. And please uh, come back and let's, let's uh, have some really interesting discussion during the afternoon. Uh, remember to vote for the best paper award as well. So thank you.